Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Reading from Luke 15, verse 11. Hallelujah. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. <laughs> but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. I want to speak to us on the topic, aren't you tired yet? You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we have seen an impeachment and acquittal of a president, the death of Kobe Bryant, the trial of Harvey Weinstein, the sentencing of Roger Stone. We have seen the death of Kobe and Gianna Bryant, the death of Kenny Rogers, the death of Wilford Brimley. We have also experienced over 150,000 dying from the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, for many, greater fear, Tom Brady has left the Patriots and signed with Tampa Bay. Each on its own are noteworthy events. 
And if we can add more insult to injury, that was only the first half of the year. We mourned as John Lewis took his final breath. We also saw the onset of murder hornets. If we could tell us in a lot that 2020 so far has been a year of, is there anything else that can happen? We have lived in a state of we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Combined with all of those, we are now seeing substantial job loss, economic turmoil, businesses have been shut down, and we have been locked up in our houses. Once we think that we have a little bit of nice weather, we go outside and we have seen a rise and increase in certain areas. This leads us to be a little weary. Recently this week, on her new podcast, Michelle Obama told the world that she was suffering with depression. When you compound everything that has happened in this one year, it has a great toil on her body. She said that she has lost sleep. She has tried to get into her routine of what was normal for her, but somehow that there are days that she can't even get out of bed. When the woman who created the Let's Move campaign tells us that working out is not a source for her, we understand that there is a great trauma that we are dealing with and facing every single day. Brothers and sisters, let us, be, let us not be uh, fooled, but what we have dealt with in this year alone can be considered traumatic. There is something about compounding incident after incident that leaves us in a place where we feel that we have no more strength. Isn't it interesting to note that even at the murder of George Floyd, we saw an increase all over the web where people were doing their best to try to find ways that we can support, find ways that we can march and protest. And in the middle of this, we heard this cry, I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing another death. I'm tired of explaining myself to people. I'm tired of trying to live one way to make people feel comfortable. If we are honest with ourselves, living life is not easy. There was a poem that said, life for me ain't been no crystal stare. And while many times we as Christians have God as our source, many pastors have said that in this period alone, they don't know what to do. In a recent conference held this past Thursday and Friday, Craig Rochelle, who is known for inventing the Bible app, said to these people, over thousands of people, I feel like a failure. How can it be that the man that has made the Bible accessible to every single one of us yet still feel like he hasn't done enough and has been a failure? May I suggest to us that 2020 has tried to weigh us down. It's tried to wear us out. And sometimes beyond the smiling face, we have to admit that we're tired. Brothers and sisters, this is a story that we're so familiar with. When we see the parable of the prodigal son. If you could with me, go with me, because I do implore you if you get a chance to read all of Luke 15, because it's wonderful. Because we now see three different ways, or told three different accounts that lead to the loss, or the same result. We see in Luke 15, we see the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. What was interesting to us in this parable of scripture is that we see that at this point in time, Jesus was passing through town. And he was surrounded by many people who we considered tired. 
He was often around what the Bible says, sinners and publicans who constantly tried to flock to be where Jesus was. The weight of their present circumstances had found them in a position where they were drained. And oftentimes, what's interesting to note is that the scripture says is that Jesus was out in the field. Here there were people that were turned down by society, people that were looked down upon. They could not go to the temple or the sanctuary because they had fear that they were considered less than. They were in a situation where they felt that people would judge them. We see that at many times it was in those areas outside of the temple that we see Jesus performing his greatest miracles to the people that people didn't admit to. We see the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She could never, ever be seen in the temple. We see the story of the 10 lepers whom he healed. They could never, ever in their state be found in the temple. We see the widow woman who is on her way to bury her son. All these things occurred at the outside of the temple. And those were the people that found Jesus. So many times we have to recognize that we see individuals that are constantly flocking to be where Christ is, but they sometimes don't fit the bill. Brothers and sisters, if we are to be honest with ourselves, there go I but for the grace of God. I was not born into the right pedigree. I may not have had the proper education. I may not have the finances, but yet though while still ostracized, isn't it good to know that Jesus always finds time for those that have been disenfranchised. So we see here that as they gathered to listen to Jesus, to be healed by Jesus, we now see those, the religious of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees, are the ones that took offense with those when they saw him around those whom we deemed unworthy. It was the ones that Jesus loved, loved, the ones that Jesus spoke to. We see the, the Pharisees now making mention that why is Jesus spending time with the sinners? Why is he the one that is spending time with those who they deem unworthy to be loved, unworthy to be approached, unworthy to speak? Those were the ones that he was there to. And now these three parables is what Jesus uses to justify his existence. He came to save the lost. He shows us that the worst of people, that those are the ones that need salvation. How much more glory would go back to God if we see those that are in need of salvation? What great joy would there be in heaven over their salvation? These three parables show us three things. That whatever is lost, first there is something that is lost. There is something that is loved and that there is something that is looked for. We understand that even in the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, there was something that separated them from the owner. What's interesting to see is that they were lost. And as we look at the prodigal son, we understand that at some point in time, he was lost to his father. If we are to fully understand the parable, we have to first recognize and settle with ourselves that God is the same father to every single person that exists. We are all the offspring created in the image and likeness of God. Our country is dealing with something right now where we're, we're struggling with a racial reconciliation. And ever since the dawn of man and the foundation of this country, we have been dealing with treating people than less than. Somehow ingrained into our very systems, we struggle to recognize that how they see us is dependent now on how they treat us. We first, in order for our country to reconcile, in order for us to get a place, we have to recognize that all men, black and white, men and women, Jews and Gentile, although astray, are all loved by the Father. We only see that at this point in time, the prodigal son, not only was he lost to his father, even before he left the house, he had been lost to his family. There was something about him that made him realize that where I was, that there is probably better on the outside. 
that he recognized that the people around him that supported him, the man had servants. He made him feel that there was something around me where I am, that this place is too small for me. I no longer trust what my father has the ability to, to do, but I desire to move out. Isn't that if we're so careful, brothers and sisters, here we are in a community and I give us a warning that us in the body of Christ, let us not be comfortable with the individual mentality. So many times we come to a situation in our lives where we believe that it's I and I'm going to get mine. I can do this on my own. I have the ability to do this by myself. And we lose and separate ourselves from community. It is so dangerous and critical that even in this time, while we understand that there is a pandemic, we cannot separate ourselves from the gathering of believers. Do not sway yourself into believing that staying at home just to watch online is sufficient if you have the ability to gather into the house of the Lord. Now I'm not trying to put any arguments here, but we have to be careful that some things that we sacrifice, some things that we hold sacred, that we must keep sacred. Earlier in my devotion this week, I was reminded, how was it that when this pandemic started, we got up out of bed? We may have changed our clothes. We found a spot just to be a part of the service. And lately we see now more than ever memes of people where they'll say that they are in church but they're really looking at their phone in their pajamas, in their bed. Lack of community, scrolling through one service to the next, maybe giving God five minutes on a Sunday. Be careful that we do not lose sense of community. But not only was he lost to the father, not only was he lost to his family, but this man was lost to himself because he didn't know where he was. He did not know who he was. He had no idea that what he was doing was going to be detrimental to himself. And we have to understand that in this par parable of the prodigal son, we have to understand that he felt that he could do better than what his father could. Isn't that just how like sin is? How it is that sin has the way to try and dispel the rumor that what God has for us is greater than what we know to do. It represents that we sometimes think that we have the ability on ourselves. What's so interesting is that the young man did not trust his father enough and said to him, Dad, give me everything and give it to me now. It's my money and I want it. We understand that we see that commercial. Little did he know that he had not yet been fully matured to understand and how to properly steward what was to him. It recognizes that no matter where we are, he is designed to represent that of a sinner. He said, Father, give everything that I have that I could put more in my mouth right now, that I can enjoy life right now, that I can do me for right now. What he failed to understand is that what God has for us, he gives it to us in time. We have to recognize that the great mistake that sin sometimes makes and has what ruins us is that we are so content to have everything for us in hand right now. That right now, that this is the life that we want to live just so we can have everything with no focus of eternity in mind. We only look at the things that are seen, the things that are temporal. We desire only present gratification. No more can we see this in our everyday lives when it is about what's on IG and how we look. Brothers and sisters, it takes us about 40 pictures to get the right one to post. And we find ourselves going after things and going after after people when we forget that this life that we live is just but for a moment at the end of the day there is eternity that we have to face sin has a way to focus on present gratification when we forget to think about the future promises what we don't understand that what we have what is spent is gone And what for? This young man, as we know, wanted to 
be able to live a life to impress people that did not care about him. So he wanted, he didn't trust his father. He didn't care and did not want to be disciplined and wanted to express his liberty. Now more than ever, if we can see our churches are in a day and age where they're saying, it doesn't matter. What's good for you is for you. What's bad for you is for you. We are seeing a commingling like never before, where we have Christians that claim the name of Christ, that feel like it's okay to justify Beyonce's behavior and say that they can now worship African-style gods. If it's not your conviction, it's okay. Brother Brothers and sisters, that is a lie from the very pit of hell. So what we find now that there is now a day and age that people are be afraid of being governed. Too long we are operating by our convictions, what we think and what we feel, rather than going back to what the word of God says. He has not given us the liberty to sin, but many a times we try to justify our behavior. Many of us who have become educated in the word of God, we were once students of Sunday school. We are so impatient. We no longer want to be confined. I no longer believe this way. What God is telling us is that we have now broken God's commandments. But that's not what he meant. Can we see it this way? If we expand our thoughts, Brothers and sisters, I believe today that the Bible is still right. We will never, ever, we try and make ourselves our masters. We make our will our own masters until we have broken all of God's commandments and find a way to dress it up as being inclusive. That is not what God's hand is saying. We're so willing to get away from the father's rule. I remember that one of the decisions I made in going to school was that it had to be close enough that if I needed them, they could get there, but far enough that they had to call first. Because there was something within me that wanted to have my own independence. I wanted to get away from their eyes so they couldn't see what I was doing. And that, the phone call, if they ever said we're on our way, gave me a good two-hour lag time to fix myself. Could that be that that is the condition that many of us in the body of Christ are now seeing? We don't want to be governed by the rules of the Lord, but we want to be close enough that we can experience the blessings. We want to be close enough to experience the mercy dewdrops. We want to be close enough to get the downpours of whatever else is falling, but I need to be far enough so I could just do me. When did it become popular to walk so close to the edge of sin. But we're okay with it because we serve a ever graceful, loving, and forgiving father. The devil is a bald head, nasty liar. We find that he didn't trust his father. He wanted to get away from his father. He didn't want to be under his management. And how proud and arrogant he was that he figured that here I am at my young age, that I am ready to live my life, that I am ready to get everything that belongs to me. How conceited he must have been, never living on his own and thought for a moment that if I had everything in my own hands, I could manage it better than my father. Now, how is it we see here that this was a man of great wealth? I would dare to say how arrogant it would be for a son that's never left the house to now know how to manage a whole household. But yet there was something in him that he was so perverted in his mind that he figured, I know better than the man that's running this whole house. If God ever leaves us to ourselves, it won't be long before we depart from him. While there is restraint that he gives us in his word, that grace, once we make a decision to leave, tends to be gone. 
That what we see in the younger son was determined when he was gone. And in order, he gathered everything together. Recognize, brothers and sisters, that when you sin, when you go astray from God, the condition is so far from you that you have to recognize that in your, sin, in your sinful state, it leaves you in a miserable state. Your sinful state is full departure and distance from God. What it is is that we now see as he's left, he was so far that nobody knew him. No one knew where he came from. No one had any recollection that this was so-and-so's son. Sin distances you to people no longer recognize your image. What's so interesting for me to know that brothers and sisters, and this is where I got excited in the scripture, is that although he was distant, Although he was in a land where nobody knew his name, his name didn't change. As my father tells me a lot, wherever you go, although people don't know you, your name is still to be them. And what's so grateful that no matter where you are, brothers and sisters, and whoever I'm speaking to, I don't care what state you're in, your name has not been changed. So while sin states you distantly, sin has a way to spend you and leave you spent. We see that once he got into town, he was the best thing on earth since sliced bread. He had friends that came to him. Everything. He was the place to be. He was the life of the party. As a matter of fact, he was the party. What was interesting to note that as long as he had something to give, as long as the party was there, he was crowded by people. Everyone loved him and everyone lauded him. But there came a time when the well went dry. He wasted what he had on riotous living. Could it be, brothers and sisters, that some of us have gifts and talents that God has placed on the inside of us. God, give me the ability to get wealth. God, give me the brains to perform surgeries. God, give me the ability to negotiate. And as soon as we recognize the gift that he's given us, we find ourselves distant from us. What was used to help build us is now we're depleting it and spending it and giving it in other ways. The gifts that God has given you to place that work even in the house, we find ourselves giving it away to a man that's not going to pay you and then lay you off two days later. What God is saying is, brothers and sisters, I have empowered you with things, but sometimes sin has a way for us to deplete and spend everything that he's given us somewhere else. Can you imagine with me, I'll say this because she's my friend, can you imagine what the enemy would have done with a sister Michelle who is so feisty and fiery all the time? Can you imagine the fights that, the, that she's doing here on the altar if she had just turned that energy to the world? Can you imagine if she had wasted the gifts that God had given her in her character? Can you imagine what the world would be like? Can you imagine, Sister Cheryl, the gifts that he had given you with your hands, the gifts that he has given you to produce calm in certain lives. Can you imagine for a moment, had you not listened to the voice of the Lord and spent it elsewhere? Can you imagine what the world would be like if some people that have the ability to preach and speak and pontificate, if they were out there being a politician and not doing any good? Brothers and sisters, we have to be careful that the gifts that he is giving us, we are not spending them out in the world more than we are here in the church. God has a way to recognize that a state of sin will leave you depleted. Sinful state will not only leave you distanced from God, it will not leave you physically spent, but it will then leave you wanting. What's interesting is that after he had spent it all, on the women and the parties and the wonderful turn up lifestyle. We now see him at a point where everything he had was gone. He could not find anyone that could have mercy on him. We see him in a situation where it left him wanting. It wanted a job, he wanted resources, he wanted a place to live. And after he had spent everything, they left. 
those leeches that come to your life to deplete the very things that God has deposited in you. As soon as the enemy steals, kills, and destroys, he leaves you in a place to rot. No longer were those that desired him. He was no longer desirable. But now he is left wanting. He wants a place to live. He wants something to eat. And what's so interesting is in that place, distant from God, spent everything that you have and wanting, there now arises a famine. Brothers and sisters, this can seem like the world of a perfect storm because those that may have had the ability to give you a handout at a time when I am depleted have nothing to give themselves. What's interesting is now he puts him, has the, now that you are wanting, it now makes you a servant. Because when I am in need and when there is nothing else to do, I must surrender to someone. And it now leaves him in a state of being a servant. When his living brought him to his very knees, he now went and joined himself to, it says, a citizen of that country. It says that same wicked life before that was presented by riotous living is now the same life that brought him to servant living. And it says here, because sinners are perfect slaves. Isn't that so sad to know that once you've spent everything, you are now bound to the hands that you are now seeking rest from. I'm interested to know that if I don't have anything, he finds himself with a man. Brothers and sisters, could it be, and some say that in this parable, that the devil is represented as a citizen of that country. He is now left to the presence of his father. He's in an, own, in an unknown town, and now he has joined himself not recognizing who he is or where he came from at that time. He's joined himself to a citizen, and the citizen says to him, here, your job is to feed what is beneath you. We join ourselves sometimes, or unbelievers join themselves to the enemy. They hire themselves out to his service to do his work. Why? Because they have nothing else. They may feel that they have no other recourse, no other result, no other resolution. And so they now make an ally with that country that they're living in. How easy it is just to go back home. But here is this young man. He is debased. He has now let go of himself. And he's hired himself that is under such and beneath him to under such a wicked master. He could have been a shepherd, tending sheep. No, that would have been a job that's worthy. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. But the very thing that he himself, a Jew, found deplorable, he found himself feeding. Isn't that the way sin will take us? so far away from who we are that the very things that we once despised and said that we would never ever do, we find ourselves feeding. And what is insult to injury is that when we're hungry, when we're in need of nourishment, when we're in need to be satisfied, we don't even have food for ourselves but he is given the leftovers of the pig. Husks that they gave him were for pig, but not for people. The wealth of the world that we're trying to live off of does us no good to our eternal souls. And isn't it funny that as a slave to sin, we find ourselves empty and we try to feed ourselves with the trash of this world. 
And this time and day and era, brothers and sisters, they said while everything was going down, the number one industry that saw stable and um, increased growth were the liquor stores. So we have now enslaved ourselves to numb the pain. We have now attached ourselves to things that would try to desensitize us from where we thought we were. And that is not the life that God has chosen for us. A sinful state will also now ultimately leave us in a state of death. The enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He comes to take every part of us. He comes to leave us depleted emotionally, mentally, physically, just so you can die, not just once, but there's a, an eternal death. And the sad part is, is that here is the father the entire time waiting, thinking that his son whom he loved, the son whom he had given everything for, was dead. But what I'm so grateful to know is that there comes a point in time when you are so tired, when you get to the end of your rope, you have a decision to make. And here he was amidst the trash, probably smelling like a pig. He recognized that in that moment, that while I may look depleted, I, I'm probably hungry, I stink, and I don't look like what I used to. Didn't I just remember that for a moment, that at one point in time in my life, uh, that I was at my father's house. Not just my family could eat, but the servants. The servants have food, but not only do they have a little bit of food, the servants have surplus. Could it be for a moment that it sometimes, I don't know, that the enemy tries to deplete us, but I'm so grateful that God's grace is yet there. That there comes a point when we are tired and tired of being tired that we recognize, wait a minute, I wasn't born for this. Wait a minute, where I am right now, I was created for greater. That where I am right now, no, 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 there is royalty in my DNA. There is comes to a point where we recognize that, no, I was created in the image and likeness of God. There comes a point in our lives where we recognize that he told me that he has plans for me, that other outcomes are to be good, that there is hope and a future and an expected end. So in the middle of the situation, amidst the trash, Amidst the, the deplorable condition in his tired state, he came to his senses. Brothers and sisters, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but are you tired yet? Has the weight of the world that we're experiencing, has it weighed you down to a point where you can recognize, you know, enough is enough. I've tried it my way. I seem to have spent everything I had, and I'm tired. I'm tired of going through the motions again and again. I'm tired of just trying to appease myself. I'm trying to make myself feel good. It's not in another degree. It's not in another job. It's not in more clothes. Wait a minute. I recognized that while I may be in a country that doesn't know my name, my name has not changed. I will arise. So in this state, while it may seem lost, we now must arise and get up. We now recognize that if he recognizes that if I can just get back to where my father is. There is something on the conscience that said, wait a minute, if I could just make a decision to get where my father is, those that I live like right now, maybe I could get some more. I don't have to eat with the pigs. Maybe I could get hamburger. What, in his pain, in his want, he came to ourselves. When we find that we are insufficient and what we're trying to do here on earth no longer makes us happy, when we've tried all the other ways to find relief 
It is time for us to make a decision to return back to our Father. When we see what's been miserable and that it can't comfort us, what we have is no value. Everything we now recognize that it is only in Jesus Christ where I can now find comfort for my soul. He now thought about it. He considered and gave himself, as I think, he weighed the options. If I stay where I am right now with the pigs, I will die smelling. I will die hungry. But if I just make the effort to make a step to my father's house, if I make the choice to walk to my father's house, there is the chance that he may regret me, that he may just reject me, but there is also the chance that he'll take me in as a servant. He considered how much better life could be if I would just return. How many times have we been balanced with the, the, the argument of, if I could just get back to where I was, we allow guilt and shame to keep us in that place. But today the Father is saying, don't be afraid because I am here. There is enough room to spare. And what I love is that there may be multiple prodigals wherever we are. And what I love is that the Father is saying that there is more than enough room for you to receive. The hired servants in God's family are well provided for. But now we should be encouraged that even though we may have gone astray, at the moment when we think about returning to him, what we love about this is that we now see how he says, we're coming back to you. What I love is that we see here the love of the father because the Bible and the scripture tells us that while he was yet afar off, standing somewhere in the distance was the father waiting. What I love about us brothers and sisters, why we can be consistently inconsistent. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. We're up today, we're down tomorrow. We see the consistency of the father's love. I don't take it as sheer luck that the father was just outside getting a 10 that morning, but there was something in him that compelled him to be in a position to watch and wait. And what we love is that the Father is telling you that while you may be tired, while you may be weary, I am waiting here with outstretched arms. Before the Father, before the Son could walk to the Father, we now see the parable that the Son is now greeted. The Father picks up himself and runs to his Son. We see that as he runs, he runs runs with open arms. Brothers and sisters, as we're tired, though we may be weary, the arms of our Father are open to receive us. He is here. He is saying that I love you with an everlasting love, that you have not changed who you are. But yes, I am here to welcome you home. Don't allow guilt and shame to keep you in a place of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Christ Jesus, while he saw him afar off, he opens up his arms even before he could utter a word. What we love is that he embraced him. He is here to say, brothers and sisters, I know your heart. Sometimes it's so hard for us to utter the words, but the very tears he understands and says, I am here for you. His eyes saw him. His eyes of mercy and love were already there. They were alert. So before he even could see on the horizon, the Father's love was there. We see that he had arms of mercy and compassion. While it may have been his situation that brought him there, it was the love of the Father that compelled him to meet him where he is. And that's why I want to share, I don't know who needs to hear it. While you may be coming in misery, while you may be coming in shame, please understand that there is a greater love that is compelling the Father to reach his arm out to you. And what I love is that his feet were quick. His love compelled his feet to run to him. So God is saying, I don't care what you've been, 
where you've been or what you've done. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what you smell like. You are my child. And all he is saying is making a decision to get to come to him and he will run to you. We'll see that he ran and that his arms and on his lips. This is the part that I fail to understand because I know me. I meet a good friend of mine. They just came from the gym. Woo. I may wait, but can you imagine after traveling, after eating pig food, after having nothing decrepit, he opens up his arms with my nasty, dirty condition, with the stench of sin all over me. Not only does he hug him, but he kisses him, which is a sign that says, I love you. Our outside circumstances have no bearing on who we are on the inside. Yes, my son, you may smell like the world. Yes, my child, you may look like there's been some dirt on you, but on the inside of you is my blood. I see you and I know you. I love you more than your outside circumstances. Here's the amazing part is that my love for you can clean off the outside circumstances. My love for you can clean whatever dirty issues that you have in your life. My love for you can wash you. My love for you can perfume you. And in a moment before you look, just allow me to clean you up because the resemblance, the resemblance is still there. Brothers and sisters, I don't know who needs to hear this, but you have not changed. Your identity has not changed. You are not your circumstances. You are not your situations. If you would just make the decision to return back to him, he is saying, I love you. I can clean you up because I could still see my reflection in your face. Still stink, dirty, tired, weak, but I see my image impressed on your face. I love you. I paid the price for you. His love, his love, his love, his perfect love is waiting. And out of that moment, he kissed them. And before he could utter the words, Daddy, I messed up. All that money you gave me, it's gone. Just if I could, don't make me a son. I just want, I just want some scraps. And the enemy would try to do this, and I'm talking from experience. The enemy would want to say, yeah, you're in the house, but you're less than. The enemy would want you to believe, okay, I messed up a few times. I went in and out. I was a revolving door. So I don't deserve. I don't deserve to serve. I don't deserve to minister. I don't deserve to witness. Because people will just look at me as a hypocrite. But God the Father is saying, uh-uh. It does not matter. Your image is here. I have called you. And you're still my son. Baby girl, on your forehead is still my name. And so he says, let's get you cleaned up. Let's get you cleaned up. Get the best robe. Get the ring. I need people to understand that when you walk in the room, although you used to stink a little bit, but baby girl, I got you. Once I've cleaned you up and put a ring on you, there is recognition that you are mine. And that's what God is saying to us. Sin a man or sin a woman. There is still a call of God on your life. He is still calling and he is still waiting. I don't care how many times you've said the sinner's prayer. I don't care how many times you've come in. He is saying, come back. Come back. Come back. You are still my child. 
there's a party happening. There's a celebration happening because yes, the one that I thought was dead, the one that people had given up on, the one that people had pushed aside, the one that had left, they're alive. It does not matter. It doesn't matter how tired you are. God is saying, take a step. But what's so interesting to me in this, we see the story that there's two, right? We have those of us that have never left the house. I've been saved all my life. Every major event in the world, I can remember where I was. My mother will tell you, when Elvis died, she was in the church kitchen, pregnant with one of us. When Whitney died, I was here in the back room. When Michael died, I was on my way to camp meeting. Some of us have been in the house the whole time. And isn't it funny? Here is what's interesting. There's a party happening, and those of us in the house are busy working. We're working, and it smells like there is a barbecue. It smells like there is something going on, that there is a celebration happening. And what's interesting now, the sun appears. What's going on? It smells like there's jerk pork seasoning in the back. And when he hears that his brother, whom he thought was dead, is back. There is a level, and I, I want us to get this. I know sometimes I joke, but let's get this. Is that a lot of times, and just like the brother, where's my party? I've been here. I've worked, and I've prayed. And sometimes we have a tendency to try and tell God and read him our record back to be in a position as if we should judge. And the more I begin to read this, here's what hit me. This is the older brother. By Jewish custom, he gets double. He gets double the inheritance based off of where he is. My brother has now spent what was given to him and the fact that he has now been given right standing means he is now entitled to what I think is mine. Brothers and sisters, so we see how the spirit of jealousy, she's back at the altar again. She's here again. We'll see how long this lasts. We have to be careful. But what I love is we see two brothers, two separate situations, both in need of love, forgiveness, and repentance. Dare I say that we have to be careful that when those that come into the house make a decision, let's scoot over. Let us welcome them with the love Aren't we tired of going through the motions? But we're rejoicing because the one that was once dead is yet alive again. And today the Holy Spirit is telling us amidst our weariness, amidst our feelings of, of feeling low, I am here to draw you. You came home with rags, but I have clothed, clothed you and adorned you. The best robe I've put on him. The worst of my old clothes that I wore and stunk are burned and buried. And now together, can you imagine the empire? And this is where my mind went. The brother that we once sought was dead. What we can do now together. 
that they had the ability, whatever may have been lost, they had the ability to gain together. God is telling us, I'm putting a ring on your hand. I've put a robe on you. I've put shoes on your feet. And there is a celebration waiting for you. Brothers and sisters, aren't you tired yet? God is saying, although you are weary, the cares of this life have the ability to weigh us down. And if we are not if we are honest with ourselves, sometimes we can allow the cares of the world to diminish how we feel and begin to separate us from the presence of the Lord. God is saying to us today, though you may be weary, though you may be tired, though you may feel like you have nothing left, I am here for you. I love you, and I am ready with mercy love and compassion to receive you. The altar, the altar, at the feet of the Father, he is waiting for you. At this point in time, there are some of us here in the building with every head bowed and with every eye closed. To say that 2020 has been a lot is an understatement. But what the Father is trying to tell us is that there is no situation that we are experiencing now or that we have ever experienced that can separate you from his love. He is telling you to take your eyes off of your situation and off of your circumstance and come to me. Though you may be weary, though you may be tired, he is saying, I am here to love you. I am here to change your outer garments because on the inside of you, my love is there. Your image is still there. Hallelujah. If there were anyone here in the house with every head bowed and every eye closed, and as I speak to those who I may not know, you may be tired from sin, going through the motions and trying to find things that can soothe you, is proved futile and you're running to things and situations trying to find that next fix to make you feel better but God is saying I am here there is nothing that can satisfy you more than the love of Jesus Christ he is saying yeah you may feel that you have spent it all you may feel like a disgrace but if you're here today would you raise your hand we want to pray with you. And those of us virtually, you can make an altar right where you are. What's amazing is that God saw his son or the father, who's the type of our, our savior, saw the son from where he was and ran to him. So if you're in the building, I'm just going to ask if you are desiring prayer, if you could raise your hand ready to make a turn and say, God, I'm tired, but I want your forgiveness. If you are at home and desire prayer, you can just bow your head right now and repeat these words. Dear Jesus, I confess today I'm tired. I am a sinner, and I'm in need of your grace. Lord, I've been running too long. I ask that today, that as I make a step to you, that you would run to me, that you would wrap me in your arms, and you would forgive me of my sins. I confess and believe that you died, and that you rose for the salvation of, your, of my sins. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Jesus name amen now if you believed what you just said it's as simple as that salvation is a gift that is so free we're going to ask that if you did confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that you just reach out to us that we can reach out to you and pray for you there are people that are here for prayer um, and if you just give us a call at 203-373-0622 
we're here to pray with you just to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If there's anybody here in the building that you want us to pray for you and with you, we see two brothers, those of us that may have left the house, those of us that are in the house, both in need of love, both of need of forgiveness, both in need of repentance. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We are so grateful for your love. Father, I thank you that when we were wretches undone, when we were far from you, when we were clothed in our sin and our shame, when we were a disgrace, when we were cast down, when we were, Father God, were left aside, there in the stench of sin, God, you loved us, you embraced us, you kissed us, you cleansed us, and you clothed us. Father, I pray for those under the sound of my voice, those, Father God, who were the enemy would want to make us feel less than, to walk in our guilt. Let them know that there is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for those that are feeling weary under the weight of our present circumstances. Father, let us cast every burden upon you. Father, you told us to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And now, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that every person here, God, under the sound of our voice, I pray, oh God, that their calling and election is sure. Father, we don't know what the rest of this year may bring, but Father God, we know that there is safety in your house. Father, we 